And he said that he was making content that he called to be edutainment. And he talked about how going forward, he wants to just make it, hey, simple, I'm going to make education style content and I'm not going to have all the flashy stuff that he had in the past. He felt that he was like almost overproducing his content to the point where it was distracting. When you relate it to videography or photography, you don't always need the extra shit. 96, 7% of the time, the effect that you're using could probably just be a hard cut. He said that if he spent a quarter of the time that he did in the post production in the pre-production, he would save like 90% of what he was doing in the post-production because it was already fixed in the preparation. Preparation changes expectation. When you Ooh. prepare, you expect to do better and your end result is ultimately always better. You got to give people a reason to trust that you're giving them solid advice. Have your proof, make a promise, and then have the plan. You do those three things, your educational content will do a lot better. There's the age old question of should you niche down? I'm never going to be one to tell you to like only make one type of content because like I don't personally. I do think though that there is benefits to having a specialty. You're able to market yourself easier and better, which then leads to you being able to charge clients more money because you do have a specialty. Also, I think we're seeing the shift right now, man. We talked about this the last few episodes, but long form is the king, man. The creator businesses that are being built in 2024 and beyond are going to be from a long form piece of content. And those are two options. Podcast, that's a YouTube video. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode 108 of the 505 podcast. We got the one-handed crack. Give me the rules real quick of Listen, the one-handed crack. Okay, if you're new here, yeah. I'm the best in the world at opening a can with one hand. And I discovered this at age 12 back in Cypress, California. Okay, you pick the can up. There's rules though, okay? You can't have any dents in the can once it's already cracked. If you have pre-existing dents, it doesn't hurt your score. But you want to lift the lid or lift the can into the air, crack it, put the tab back, and then set it down. That's the whole rules to the game. And you're scored one or zero through 10. I had a lot of zeros recently. There's really <laughs> make, give me mad on the stories. So you got to lift it up right there. You see that how I'm not touching the lid. A lot of you messing that up. Okay. Then you just go and you just send it. And that my friends is a damn good score. That because was good. It, I know, right? I know every day, every day I do that. I wake up right out of bed and I hit one. Okay. I have a fridge next to my bed now. Okay, go. <laughs> so I can practice. <laughs> Mine isn't as good. Okay, so. show me what uh, you got. I can never get my fucking finger. Dude, I'm just not built for it. What are we going to that fancy gym for if you can't open this drink with one hand? That was pathetic. Hand? Absolutely pathetic. That Cheers, was so my bad. Good to be back. I might retire from the one-handed crap, mm. bro. God, it's good. Now, I had to hobble over here. It yeah. was it was really hard for me to get in this chair. Let me tell you, everything is in so much pain right now, man. And why is that? Because I ran twenty six point two effing miles. A little golf clap. Okay, here's the deal. Okay, I logged fifty runs. I went and looked at my app before the big day. Wow. And let me tell you, it's just not enough. You, I think not enough. No, I really think to Wait, get. Wait, hold on. Fifty runs over how long? My first run was on like January nineteenth or twentieth or something like that. So, I ran on May 5th. So four and a half-ish months. But see, it's weird because you're only running three to four times a week. And the thing that I find interesting, let's say I was like in high school, baseball, wrestling, right? You're yeah. practicing five times a week for your sports, basketball. You're, you're practicing, you know? So like a month is a real true month. And I don't feel like it's that for running personally. Mm. So like when you say, oh, I've been training for four months, it's not really four months. 50 runs in my head is a little over a month. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, you train for almost two months. I don't think it's like, you know, you train for four and a half months personally, just because I think about all the other sports that I do. And I, I consider like the outing of the practice. That is a day logged on the, on the calendar. You know what I mean? I see your point. It's a little different. It's obviously it's a different because it's running. You got to give yourself time to recuperate. Yeah. But even with like when we were playing baseball growing up, right? Th yeah. Think about if I was like, oh, you trained 50 times in the whole summer. I'd be like, sure. Be like, what? You, were, you weren't doing two a days, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm getting twice oh, as good as you. So you're not making varsity. Yeah, you're not making varsity. You're going for JV. So 
I don't know. I think I needed more time. And, and but what does that look like? Is that mm, you think closer to four to five times a week? Or do you think it's, you I think, think it's five times I was a week? A, I was a baby rock. Okay. I was a baby rock. And those of you that are new here, you probably are a baby rock. And the way that you get to boulder status is you have to hit the subscribe have button. To. Helps the boys out a ton. Helps fund this whole operation. But my left knee tendon like on the back of your knee right i feel like i could barely lengthen out my knee for like a few weeks and i was just like well this is great and i'm having like four miles and then it ramps up to 10 and then it's like 15 on the sunday and i'm like oh my god i will say huh. you ramped up your miles quite quickly i the first the first week dude i don't this app it's gotta be a little you confused. did like a nine mile run yeah. the first week in bay in the bay i remember i was in san francisco with the lakers right we're at the we're at the ritz hotel or something like that and i'm i'm over there and i'm like oh shit i'm looking at the app i gotta run nine miles through the streets of san francisco also worst idea ever the hills are just practically oh, vertical in san francisco yeah. that nine miles took me hours dude i remember stopping i'd like stop the watch because i'd make me feel better about sure. myself if i just walk yeah. for a sec i'd be like yeah we're gonna pause this for a sec and then we're gonna keep going see i think going from not running to first week going nine miles just don't think that's mm -mm. the best way to go about it i don't think so either and i had a shoe saga i had like six you did six pairs of shoes so a lot of things working against me yeah. for the big day. You know, we finished in four hours and 29 minutes. And thank you. Let's go. I really wanted to break four hours, dude. In the half, I was cooking. I had a half pace of just under two hours. But I knew when I got the pace of my watch for the two hours, I was like, there is no chance <laughs> we're keeping this up. And I wanted to run with my good buddy, Andrew. And his knee was hurting him. And he still just was flying. He's like a gazelle. He's a super tall fellow, right? And those tall guys do they they're for every two step yeah. for every step i'm taking two and a half you know so i wanted to be up with the guys and let me tell you it's super humbling running a marathon because there's all these different body types dude all of all, every single body type you could ever imagine is just cooking you and age range age range dude these older people are just flying by yeah. me this guy's like 70 dude and just cruising by me it no care for anything in the world just vomits there's a guy in a speedo and a sombrero, and I was hanging with him for a minute. And you, you see these characters because they're with you for such long periods of time, and there's nothing to do. You're just yeah. looking around at the different people that yeah. like are on this awful journey with you, and you're like, okay, it's you and me, sombrero man. And then sombrero guy left, and I'm like, and he was in a speedo, right? Just flying 730 pace a little bit more aerodynamic i think that's what it was yeah. and he he was clean shaved and i think that had something to do with it and and then all of a sudden <laughs> there was uh there was this guy next to me i, I like he just kind of spawns and he's wearing a freaking bear helmet like kanye west in um in the album you know that the graduation bear? yes bear? the bear yeah. helmet he's wearing a full suit that's insane and he's just chugging dude yeah. and, and it just makes you want to just stop running <laughs> and just be like what am i even doing here man the little bear is ca it's caught me yeah. and then he just chugging on the little bear suit and all i could think about though the whole time because my whole fam was there chloe was there uh, sharif was there it was very nice to be able to look to the side at these mile markers and just have a water bottle. But me and my mom, we were not dialed on the handoffs. We we thought we had a dial. <laughs> oh, man. Is, dude, mile 11. Well, I that's had, why you didn't break four. That is no. And I told her that I was like, you are probably one of the reasons why I didn't do this. I had my water bottle. Right. And so she hands me off the water and we're communicating. We're about 50 yards away. Yeah. I say, cap off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotta yeah, have yeah. the cap off. Gotta. We need to have a quick transfer into my water bottle that I'm holding. I'm an idiot and I grab the water bottle thinking in my head because my brain's not really working and functioning at mile 11. I pour it in and I think that I have the cap for the the plastic water bottle in my hand. It's my main water bottle oh. and I just send it to the left off a cliff and I'm like looking at it. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and so then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to pour a little bit out and I'll just keep this. And then water's splashing oh, me in the no. face and I'm like, just throw that away and thank God next mile they just were just there. They just appear yeah. water bottle in hand. That was great. And I really needed that. What miles did you eat your gels at? Every four. Every four. Mm -hmm. I brought five of them with me. Do you feel that was the right? Yeah, I think that pace. was the right thing. I just think, dude, you got to run these long runs. My longest yeah. run leading up to it was 16 miles. Yeah, you said that. And th so after 16, this is just all new territory for your boy. And you needed an extra 10. I needed to get to 20 during the practices. Yeah. And that's what everyone recommends is you hit a 20 and then you find six miles on the big day. You just find them. You just got to dig for them.
It was, it was funny though. Sharif is vlogging me, right? And you guys are going to see this YouTube video that I make. I don't want you to think I'm going at this fast all the time at like mile 16 because I would, I would be, ha I would be hooking a trailer with a lot of rocks in it. Right. And I'd see this man with that vlog camera and I would pick up that pace. I'm like, I'm not looking like this on video. I'm going to, I'm going to buckle in right now. I'm going to give a good speech to the camera. And he would be like, he was like at 13, like 16 and 20. And when I'd see that dude, I would just light up. Cause I'm like, we're going to cook a little faster here. We're going to go a 730 yeah, pace. Yeah. This is, it was funny because he goes, dude, you're falling behind 430. I saw the little guy walk by with the 430 flag and I'm like, we got to catch that guy. And that's all I was thinking about the whole time. And I did come in dude, thank God for him because after I would get by these little spurts of him with the camera, I would get back into slow yeah. into snail pace into just this, this very light jog. And, <laughs> and it was funny because I started talking to this one kid who was like our age and he goes, first one, this sucks, huh? And I go, this sucks. Dude, he this, knew. Oh, we were all in some. That we were in the caboose. Dude, we called it. I called it the caboose. That's funny. And all I could do when I was in so much pain is, I swear to God, smile from ear to ear. Yeah. Because that's the only thing that makes it slightly better is just like trick yourself and say, "This is super fun. I'm having a great time. Everything's in so much pain." Well, you were also on like what four hours of sleep. The Three fact, and a half. The fact that Three they made you start so early, little bullshit. 530 I was I was thinking about this there needs to be a sleepers um a sleepy marathon they need to coin at that the 505 yeah. sleepy marathon and we're well, going to start it we're going to start at 11 11 o'clock for everyone yeah. else and it's it's just one of those things man and you also had a, a super busy weekend well I did and I was laughing because I got home uh -huh. at the same time that you woke up for the marathon like I literally walked into our apartment at like 3:30 or 3:45 yeah, I was just waking up you were waking up but um, it was raining, dude. What is going on? What the heck, dude? What's up with the rain? I couldn't believe it. I woke up and I was like, I, I <laughs> you know, that video of the runner in Oregon and she's being interviewed in the snow and she goes, this is the perfect texture yeah, 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 for yeah, yeah, running. Yeah. That's what I kept telling everyone that we'd see. Like, it's raining. I'm like, this is the perfect texture. <laughs> they would all get the reference. It's incredible. <laughs> but um, yeah, I shot a concert for Dylan Francis on Saturday, which was super fun. He is the funniest nicest dude i don't know if you guys are familiar with him as a dj but he's like a hilarious follow on social media and i've been following him for a while um shout out to daniel bennett because he's the one who connected us he um he's been wanting to have me shoot for him for a minute it just didn't line up lined up this time um so i drove with him i went over to his house and then we drove to uh to the oc because that's where the show was and um I go to his house and it's permit parking outside. And he, I just got to read you this text because he's so funny. Where is it? Hold on. Let me find this one sec. One sec. He's tight. He typed these to himself before the pod. No, nope. here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I go, do you have a, uh, do you have a permit for parking? He goes, yeah, I'll come grab you one sec. My dogs are really mad right now. I don't want them to bite you. You cool with dogs. They're just really mad. His tour manager goes, haha. He goes, and they don't like photographers. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, this guy's, this guy's cool. Cause you never know, man. Yeah, you never like, know the people that you're filming, but he was like super, super cool. And, um, I want to shout out Mike B, uh, the other guy that was filming the concert. Um, I like put my bag down, got my camera ready. And he's like, 505 podcast. I'm like, you already know. <laughs> Let's go. So shout out Mike. Met that some was rocks. Dope. Yeah, dude. Met some rocks. That's um, awesome. I was so tired on, Sunday. Yeah. Yesterday. I mean, I didn't go to bed till five and it, it just gave me PTSD <laughs> to, touring, to, tour to, life. to tour, man. I was like, bro, this is why I got out the game. <laughs> like, but I will say like, it was super fun to shoot in a concert again and I'm getting back into it. Um, I actually got reached out to by, um, insomniac to shoot EDC this year, which I'm really excited about. That'll be in, You're I gonna believe do it. two weeks. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to do it. It's funny. I originally got reached out to, to do EDC camp which is a whole different thing <laughs> and i uh so we, I, we found out and and i talked to a friend of mine who has done it and she was like don't do it she goes it is the worst hours and you're not even shooting the concert you're just shooting the people who are camping and like the installation she's like you're not even like at edc you're like in the parking lot next door or something <laughs> And I was like, okay, cool. Passed on that. And then I got hit up to actually shoot EDC. And I'm really excited because it's my first time actually shooting a full festival as opposed to just working with one artist. From people who I've talked to, it's going to be a fucking grind. It's like 10, 12 hour days. Those are three, just three days. It's three days. Um, so I travel there. I'll get to Vegas on Thursday, shoot Friday, Saturday, Sunday, come back Monday. 
But EDC is interesting because the festival literally starts at like six or seven. It's it's PM? dawn t- it's dawn till dusk. Yeah, like the, or AM. It no, it starts from it starts from seven. It starts from seven p.m. Okay, and it goes to like sunrise. Oh my god! So my hours are going to be kind of fucked. These people are a different breed, man. Yeah, but I'm only photographing, which is nice. Um, on the concept of hours, I want to yeah. get your take on this. I. I typically am in the sketch boy hours era, right? And th- those yeah. are the hours of like 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. A lot of you partake in these hours. We've talked about it. It's a great time. Great time to be awake. No one's up. I might, as an adult, swap. I, I do. And go to reverse sketch boy hours is what I'm going to call them, coining them now. And that'd be like 6 a.m. Because at the marathon, right, I kind of liked being up that early. And I was like, this could be interesting. And... There's science behind this. Yeah. This isn't, I'm just not pulling this out of my ass that as people, as human beings, if we wake up when the sun comes up, it's like our ancestors do. They're out hunting. What sun comes up, we're hunting, dude. Circadian rhythm. We're, we're, the circadian rhythm is firing at 6 a.m. in the morning. And then you go to bed at like 10, you yeah. know, and wake up and run it back. And I'm going to do a 30 day challenge of this, of the oh. 6 a.m. Because it's the only way I'm going to be able to do it. I sure. have to do challenges. Otherwise, yeah. it just doesn't work for a guy that has like, ADD. I like that. I can't just like say I'm going to do it. No, it has to be like, hey, I'm doing this for 30 days and I got to post about it because then it'll keep me accountable and I'll actually do the damn thing. And I made a YouTube video of the marathon, which I'm very excited. It's going to be the first YouTube video out. And I filmed like six. I just haven't found the time to do that. And are you, are you going to edit those six or are they so far in the past? I think there's there's just so, they're just so gone, (laughs) but they're a good practice. Yeah. Because I was talking to the camera. I was like learning how I want to talk and the things I want to do. You filmed a lot of your training yeah i did no which is going to be perfect for this video okay like i'm going to bring all of the training stuff into this video because i have these like i would literally set up the camera and leave and then come back and film my honest reaction of how awful you know those runs were so it's going to be fun by the way did they have any drones at your your show that you filmed over the weekend any drones in the air they didn't have any (laughs) drones um, at the show that I did, but they probably will at EDC. You know what they should do though? With, Tell me. With drone footage. You got to ask for permission if you're going to steal it, dude. So the guy, the fellow that wrote Atomic Habits, don't read the book. Don't support that guy. Can you summarize it for me real yeah, quick? Yeah, dude, just do shit consistently <laughs> and good stuff will happen for you. Okay, yeah. that's the book. You don't, I just saved you guys all 25 bucks. That guy that wrote Atomic Habits has stolen a drone shot from a creator that we know, right? My friend, uh, Danny McGee, he posted this story today. Then I, I saw it and I I was extremely butthurt for this guy because this guy posted this drone shot, cool ass drone shot. And the, the fellow who wrote Atomic Habits, what's this guy's name? James Clear, something like that. This guy sucks. Best known for his book, Atomic Habits and stealing drone shots. Who do you steal this drone shot from? Parker Shepard. P. Shep FPV. I follow him. Shouldn't have stole it, dude. How hard is uh, Dude, you are rich, bro. Buy a drone shot. How hard is that? He took this drone shot. It's fucked up. Not only did he just steal it, right, without crediting Parker, he ran it as an ad on Facebook. He's oh, see, mo- that's, that's, he's monetizing it, yeah, right? He's can't mo- do that. monetizing off of the thing. That's brutal, man. Come on. It's okay. I think, let's say he used it as B roll for something. I wouldn't be as mad. I would, I would, I would, I would, I would say you should credit the guy, right? But I wouldn't be like, oh, this guy's a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit when you run it for an ad, when you profit off of someone yeah, else's you can't work. Do that. And our boy here, Parker. Has, Parker, has sent him an invoice, which is funny, and he's viewed it twenty times, <laughs> an unreal amount of time to view the invoice. Dude, just click pay. You got money, man. Yeah, I can't be doing that. It's pretty messed up. It I will say though, me, bro. go check out Parker if there's anything that positive that comes out of this maybe he'll get some followers his fpv stuff's like incredible never met him but we've dm'd actually a little bit um I seems can't, like, can't believe that i can't believe that people suck dude also shout out to all of you all the rocks yeah. that listened to our last episode with hayden if you want to become one of the best editors in the world i highly recommend you go back to episode 107 with our buddy hayden okay he gave so much valuable advice i felt like i was in a master class on editing yeah. the whole time learning stuff the whole time which is crazy that's the best part about this is we bring on people and we also get to learn from them as we're hearing about their stories things they're interested in uh, and he just dropped some gems on everything having to do with getting behind the computer and cooking up a beautiful story it's cool that we get to have people on like him because he just does stuff that i honestly have no desire to do i hate editing videos <laughs> like honestly especially for other people i i find i enjoy doing it for myself but like when i can 
I pass off the editing. Like I like to shoot, but I don't like to edit. So it's really cool to hear his take on things because his mind works in a different way than I, than mine does. But speaking of people that we've learned stuff from, like Hayden, our good friend, I'd like to call him a good friend, but <laughs> our buddy, <laughs> never met him, <laughs> Alex Hermosi. Um, he recently put out a really cool video um, of him breaking down how he gained, I want to say it was what, 7.8 million followers on social media. I believe it was 7.2 or 7.8. Over the course of like 40 months. And what I really like about Alex is one, he's just like so entrepreneur through and through, but he looks at things on a grand scale, like a grand time horizon. So you see a lot of people being like, oh, how I gained like, you know, 10,000 followers or 100,000 followers in like a month or like 90 days. He's like, let me show you what I did over the course of like two and a half years, what I thought was working and how I switched um, because he, he gives some keys about like, this is how I thought originally, and this is how I'm going about things now and how he was able to gain like so many followers in, what is that? No, 40 months is like three 12, and a half. 24, 36. It's like over three years. Mm -hmm. I like that he's looking at it from that time I like horizon. your math on the two years. You know what? <laughs> I take photos, man. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. And I think there's so many things that you're going to be able to pull out of this yeah. and put it into your creative work. Some things that you're like, hey, that's doesn't align with the things that maybe you want to do. Maybe you, maybe some of the advice was like, I don't know if that really aligns with, and we, we have a few things that we picked up. Well, that was interesting too, is because. And our fields are just different. They're, exactly. they're very different. He's in the, he's in the straight up. It's the business niche. That is who he's trying to talk to. He's trying to talk to people who own businesses, who are interested in opening businesses or eventually want to sell their businesses. And he wants to eventually buy them with his company acquisition.com. And I think, when you're, you know, looking to get advice or um, figuring out who you should take advice from, it's not everybody. Like mm. there are certain things that you, I believe there's certain things you can learn from pretty much anyone you talk to. But like, if they're not doing what you want to do, take what they say with a grain of salt. There's some things that Alex was talking about that we agree with that you should do for sure. And there's other things that he was talking about that we were discussing that like, oh, maybe we don't actually agree with this, but that's okay because he's doing something different than we what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And he, he talked about this shift in kind of the content that he was creating. I also think there's one more bucket that he missed out on. So he talked oh, about interesting. education and entertainment. And I think there's the other one is inspire. Um, and I think with each of those, I will define them briefly for you. Education, you're teaching people things about something that you know about, right? Entertainment, you are using your personality, whether you're funny, dry humor, you're very extroverted to explain to them something, right? Whether it's in a video format, whether it's text format, uh, whether it's via a podcast, just your voice. And the last one is inspire. And that one, you're almost making content about your journey, whether, hey, I was I was once here, I had a baby Canon, little Dizzler T5i, and now I shoot with a red and I shoot for this team or I do do X, Y, and Z now. That would be an example of inspiring content. Uh, he really just broke down though the big two. He was talking about education and entertainment. And he said that he was making content that he called to be edutainment, right? Where he was educating people, cracking jokes, and it was just this mixture of things. And it wasn't just either directly entertaining and it wasn't directly education, right? And he talked about how going forward, he wants to just make it, hey, simple, I'm going to make education style content and I'm not going to have all the flashy stuff that he had in the past. So he'd, he'd have like a whoosh in, he'd have these behind him, he had a solid, a very solid editing team. He would like cut himself out, right? His team would cut himself out and have like a diagram of like a chart going up. And it almost felt like a short form video that you threw on YouTube. So you grab that minute video, right? And then you made it 26 minutes or you made it 15 minutes and that those effects and things that were happening, the text on the screen that was going on the longer form video. And he's like, I think I'm going to go away from that. I'm going to really just focus on giving value to the people that are trying to watch these videos. And I think you guys can take something from that with just the fluff that you might be adding into the things that you're making. Is the story that you're trying to tell, is the video that you're making good without all the effects? And I think you look at these super flashy edits, you see it a lot in sports content. Definitely. Where they use like, it's just like, like a, lightning yeah. and, it, and it's almost, it's overly produced to the point where you're like, well, are your shots even that good? You don't Is even know who won the game. Exactly. Is the story you're telling good? 
Yeah. I want to kill that fly. Yeah, damn. I'm going to Jackie Chan that fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's trying to educate and he felt that he was like almost overproducing his content to the point where it was distracting. He was having like, you know, these backgrounds that were moving and he's like, people are just here to learn from me and I don't need all this extra shit. And I think that when you, you know, relate it to videography or photography, you don't always need the extra shit because it sometimes is too distracting and it sometimes just hides from like the story that you're trying to tell. 96, 7% of the time, the effect that you're using could probably just be a hard cut mm -hmm. and have really good sound design, really good color. Usually when you see a ton of effects and they're every half a second, right? The shots sucked. Yeah. And you, that, that is why there's so many effects and people, kudos to you if you learn how to edit well that's awesome if you add that with great cinematography you are going to be so much further ahead than 95 percent yeah. of people dude if you just look at your video and really think like how can i get the best possible shot how can i make sure the lighting is the best possible thing in this that'll make coloring way easier your audio how do i get good audio on set boom let's mix it with maybe the b figgy essential sound effect pack that's linked down below amazing sound effect pack 160 sounds cop that then you throw that all together and you have a banger cinematic video dude the people are loving people are eating it up and i think it's really interesting um you know something that he's how he's changing his content and him going just all in into the educational content as opposed to the entertainment i think works for him because of the target audience that he's trying to get to i think as content creators, filmmakers, photographers, videographers, you need a balance of both. I think if you are trying to monetize as a content creator and monetize your content, you need the um, actual videos and content that you make, like the stuff that you mm -hmm. make for clients or yourself, like the actual video, you need that because it gives you credibility when you are doing the educational content, explaining how you did X. And I think that with the educational stuff, personally, if I was just making educational stuff like he is, I would hate it because that's not what I got into it for. I got into yeah. it to share stories and to document my life and document things that are going on that I feel that I want to share takes on different topics, things that I see, things going on in our industry. And that is what I think is so cool about what we do, what you all do that are listening to this is you have this blank canvas where you could wake up and say, I want to teach people this today. Yeah. And then you can wake up the next day and say, I want to inspire someone with this story that I heard today or that I read in this book. I want to grab this on text and figure out how I can put it into a video format that someone can watch on their phone. That's really cool, you know? And we as creators, we have uh, we have this this gift to be able to share it in all these different types of mediums and take things that we see in different mediums and be able to transcribe it into a yeah. video that someone can watch on their phone or on their TV. It's really it's amazing. And it works for him because he said also in the video, you also have to know what you like doing, like plain and simple. You got to know what you like. Maybe yeah. you're listening to this. And you're like, yo, I don't even really love making videos, but I'm super technical about editing. I know a ton about it. I know how to teach how to make a good video, but I might not love making videos for other people. Great. Your content could be educational and you're going to love that and everything's going to be fine and dandy. But for one of you out there that's like, yo, I hate teaching. I just want to share my work. Again, awesome. There's room for all of you in that category and any of those categories that we just mentioned to have a seat at the table and have a big audience or a big brand or, you know, have a business around each of those different areas. It doesn't have to be just one. The second point that he made was preparation over post-production. He was saying that he wasn't spending enough time preparing and then it would cause him to have to spend so much more time in the post-production and editing process. He said that if he spent a quarter of the time that he did in the post-production in the pre-production, he would save like 90% of what he was doing in the post-production because it was already fixed in the preparation. And I think that you can so correlate that <laughs> as you know a creator when you're working with a client. If you're making a video or doing a photo shoot, prepare as much as you can, ask as many questions 
and have them answered by the client as possible. Choose the song and get that approved before <sighs> on. you make the video. All these things that you can handle in the pre-production stage to make your actual shoot go smoothly and then post-production, it leads to less edits and less revisions. I got a good one for you. Preparation changes expectation. When you Ooh. prepare, you expect to do better and your end result is ultimately always better. And in a new movie that I just saw, Dune 2, right? The VFX artists, they gave so much kudos to our buddy Dennis and the DP on the project because they said they shot this thing perfectly to where it made VFX so much easier for them to have those big worms like coming through the ground. It needed to be shot in a very specific way. It needed to be lit a very specific way. And the sun needed to be in a particular direction to make everything look seamless so it didn't look fake. And I think that with any project that you guys do moving forward, the difference between you right now, if you're a baby rock or you're maybe a, a big rock or you're a boulder, is it's preparation, right? Totally. The pros, I've been seeing this a ton recently and people are doing this in the big ad agency world, in the big production world. They're shooting their spots before they even go make the film. And so they'll say, hey, we have a, for big spots, we have a 20K budget for you to shoot this on an iPhone. And we want this to be exactly how it'll look. And I've been seeing these awesome videos on my Explorer because I keep liking them. And so I'll see this video of a guy of their team shooting it on a phone, all these crazy transitions they're actually gonna do in the spot. It makes the spot so much easier because then the client sees and goes, this is exactly how we want it to go. Um, and so for those of you out there, even on the small scale, even like a small project, maybe it's thousand bucks, maybe it's 500 bucks. If you want to be really prepared and you're like, oh, I have it at the football field. You should go out to the football field a week in advance with a, with a, a person or your friend or your dad or your mom, whatever, and say, hey, I want you to stand there. I want to see what the sun's going to look like in this specific shot. I want to understand at three o'clock where it's going to be and five where it's going to be. If we shoot from this direction, where's the light going to be hitting? And you will be so much further ahead than someone that just shows up with their camera. When you get out of that mindset of, I'm just going to show up and figure this out in post, you're going to take leaps and bounds in the industry doing all of these different things if you prepare and you have a shot list, right? And all of those different things help you prepare and you'll be able to charge more from your work. What else helps you charge more from your work is the pricing guide that's linked down below. People, I'm telling you, dude, people down below have been closing big deals. Today, I got a DM today, actually. Someone closed a thousand dollar deal and he said he was only going to ask for 500 bucks, but he watched the pricing guide video and he locked in some bread. And that's what it's about. Seriously, making more money, making big plays. That's what the rocks do around here. Basically, the pricing guide is we tell you how to price your work for like 10 different niches um, within photo and video. And we go into detail of like how to do that. And it's really awesome. And if you haven't copped it, you should get it down below. How much are we charging? 57? 57 bucks. Dude. You kidding me? 57 and that to guy, make a grand? That guy just made 500 extra <laughs> bucks on. off $57. That's could be, so worth it. Could be you. One thing that Alex said in, in his in his talk is that he, he thinks you should do this in every video, okay? He thinks you should proof, promise, and plan. Proof looks like talking about what you know. So explain, hey, my name is Costas Garcia. I'm a concert photographer. I've toured with Loud Luxury. I just shot Dylan Francis this weekend. And today I'm going to tell you about how to fix your photos. That'd be a pretty damn good hook. I'd sit there and I'd say, this guy knows what he's talking about. Hell I yeah. should probably listen to him. The promise is the second part is tell them what they're going to get. I'm going to teach you how to fix your photos today. Great. I'm confirming why I clicked on this video. This guy's going to teach me how to fix my photos. And the second part is to plan, set expectations of what will happen next. Let's hop into X, Y, and Z. So they know exactly where they're going. The worst thing, and what I'm realizing, I probably did this in every single YouTube video back in the day, is I'd have the thumbnail, right? And then I would go into something completely different than what the thumbnail was talking about. And it's crazy now looking back and I I'm watching all of the biggest and best YouTubers of our generation and I'm analyzing the things that they're doing and I'm like, why was I not doing this? Why was my thumbnail not correlating with the first portion of my video? Because when someone clicks on it and there's 12 different videos and people have the attention span of a baby squirrel, you want to be able to click in and say, this is what we're doing. We're going on this journey or we're going on a cruise today and I'm studying abroad. So then people know, hey, this is what's happening. I'm excited to be here and I'm fired up and I'm going to sit through this 10 minute long video because you've now confirmed for me that you're actually going to come through on the promise of that title and the thumbnail. People don't like to be baited, dude. We, we found that out. <laughs> Very true. I, I think though that um, if you're making educational content, right? If you're a photographer and you're making content about how to be a better photographer, however that looks like, you got to give people a reason to trust that you're giving them solid advice. And I really, I think this is great. Like have your proof, 
make a promise and then have the plan. And I think that if you do those three things, um, your educational content will do a lot better. The next point that he talks about is that he's changing his content focus, which I thought this was interesting. We differ a little bit mm. on what he has to say about this, but he was basically saying that like, instead of him having so many different topics of content that he's making, whether it's, you know, about food or him lifting and, and business, and he has all these different kind of like niches under the Alex Hermosi brand, he's going all in on business and kind of leaving like all of that stuff behind. There's the age old question of, should you niche down? And I'm never gonna be one to tell you to like only make one type of content because like I don't personally. I'd be it's, so bored. It's no fun. Like nobody wants to just make one type of content. I do think though that there is benefits to having a you know specific niche and, and having a specialty. Yeah, because people know exactly what they're gonna get from you. So you're able to market yourself easier and better, which then in turn leads to you being able to charge clients more money because you ha you do have a specialty. Definitely, and when you think, I had to hire someone to shoot underwater stuff, dude. When you're looking around and this yeah. guy has the craziest underwater rig set up and he's like, oh, I shoot sharks. That's the guy I wanna hire. I don't wanna hire the guy who's never been underwater and it's their first time ever. You wanna hire the guy who's the best at it, right? Exactly. And you, even you think about the things like in your home, if you wanted to, if your dishwasher is broken, who do you call, dude? You know, you're not gonna call a guy that fixes lights to go fix the dishwasher. It just doesn't work like that. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So you, you really wanna think about, I. I've said this before, Pareto Optimal Employee, okay? It's a T, okay? And it goes down deep. So you have these different skills that you know, whether it's Photoshop, Lightroom, right? But the deep one that you might be doing is concert photography. But you're like, hey, I could also shoot a video for you. I could do that. That's not a problem. You could get paid to do that. Yeah. And you have these different skills that you kind of tack on to your arsenal. But you have that one thing that you're pretty damn good at and that your page is almost known for. It's so interesting though, because we, you and me have talked about this a ton. Like I think... I think we're seeing a shift though where you are the niche, right? But that, but then you still almost do have to have this one thing that you're good at and that you're known for. And then you kind of, you build around the the pillars, right? Yes, and I, I think when you specialize in something, that is when the leads come to you. Like you mm. market yourself as the specialist that allows you to wake up tomorrow morning with an email being like, hey, we're looking for a photographer or videographer that does this. You're the best at this. So we're coming to you. And then because they're coming to you, you can charge more because you're like, I'm the best at this. I specialize in this. This is what it costs to work with the best. And I think just to keep it fun, like you can have, that's what's great about social though. You can have a thing that you are filming for fun. Totally. You're like our vlogs, our vlogs, you and I vlogs, yeah. they're, they're just for fun, yeah. right? But what's crazy is peep clients see those, dude, and they want to work with you based off of maybe you're super funny or you have a dry sense of humor or you are running a marathon and the person on the brand side is also training for something sure. and they align with the things that you're also doing. That's a, that's a cra it's crazy because it's going to happen to some of you. You're going to be posting about something and someone's going to be like, dude, I, I had no idea how many of you rocks are runners. You guys are just fucking track stars. You give me all this advice unsolicited and it's fine. Um, but no, I'm just kidding. I really did love the advice you guys gave me. Uh, but it, it's crazy because the things that, that you're passionate about or a hobby of yours, it might be the other thing that brings people together and it's the differentiating factor between you and just another creator who is only showing their work, only like business, only talking about one thing. I personally love to follow people who are posting about different stuff. It, totally. it, keeps, it keeps it interesting and I'm like, oh, you're interested in that too. I also am interested in that. You see someone post, I saw someone the other day who is a creator in our space who started posting about the cologne that they like. I love cologne. We had a great conversation on cologne around the different colognes that we like, the different things that are popping out. And that's just something that's so random that you wouldn't know yeah. that this group of men are interested in. But we do. We all wear, we all wear great cologne. I yeah. wear amazing cologne. <laughs> smells so good, dude. <laughs> yeah. I think that it just humanizes you if you bring your other interests into your content. We've talked about it before. I, I will say though, like we've gotten this question a few times of, I shoot weddings, but I'm also doing concerts or I do events, but I also do sports or whatever it may be. You're doing two different things. People are like, do I post all this stuff on the, the same Instagram or do I make different pages? How do I go about it? I would say if you have multiple niches that you um, want to market yourself as, I would make 
separate pages for each. I have a separate page just for my concert photography. I want to make another one for like just my travel and lifestyle stuff. I think there's something to be said about maybe you have your main page where you show more of your personality and your educational content, whatever it may be. But like, it's weird if someone's posting concert and wedding stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like you should separate the two. And I think an easy way to do that is to have multiple accounts. It's like almost how ha- it's like having multiple pages on your website. Yeah. Concerts and weddings right next to each other. You'd be like, this guy rages the weddings. Mm-hmm. What, like, what's going on, dude? Like, yeah. it'd just be a little off, you know, some would, some would be a little interesting. Hermosi also said, another thing I want you to think about in your content are the different metrics that come along with them, right? Whether it's likes, comments, shares. And he spoke about changing their ideas because they'd have a video, they would hit like 10 million views, right? And they'd look at the ad revenue and this thing would generate, let's just call it a thousand bucks just for fun, just for the sake of the video. They'd make it like a thousand bucks, right? Then they'd have another video that would hit a hundred thousand, but it would make more money ad wise than that one video, than the big one that hit like 10 million. And they're like, what's going on here? And it's because the views are completely different. There's such a much more dedicated group of people that were following those 100,000. They would be very direct, like these are the the top business tips to 10x your growth or whatever. The other one would be like, this is the food I eat in a day. And so it's way more broad to different people, but those people that are having, those people that are having more niche content are getting a way higher CPM. And that CPM number is basically on YouTube for every thousand views, let's say some channels get like five bucks. Some of the channels like the credit card channels, those channels get like $18, dude, because their stuff is so niche down and American Express is, hey, I want to go put my ad dollars behind this guy's video because I know people that are watching this video, the 10 credit card tips are going to be in the market for an American Express credit card. That's how this stuff works in Adland. It's very interesting. So they start looking at this metric and saying, hey, that's what we want to focus on. We want these ad numbers, the ad revenue numbers to be higher. And that's the type of videos that we're going to double down on because we want those people because those are the people that are actually going to invest in the things that we are selling, the things that they're selling for their gym or for acquisition.com. Those are the people that are building businesses They're like hey he says it in all the in all of his videos like i don't have anything to sell you but if your business makes over 10 million dollars a year we want to talk they do have something to sell you he's giving you all this amazing information because in hopes that your little business grows and gets to 1 million then 2 million then 10 million and then when you want to go up from there he's like hey i've helped 100 people do this before you you've learned from me. We've gotten you there. We've gotten you this far. Let's go the extra mile. Let's get you to a hundred million. And he's done it before, right? So those are the people that you want to trust. He's making all this great content for little business owners, medium sized, and even large business owners to say, Hey, let's get to the big dog territory to where maybe we can sell this thing and have an exit. You know what I mean? What's also interesting about how he's measuring his metrics is switching from views to ad revenue. You may not be on YouTube and getting ad revenue, but I will say that you should probably switch your metric of success from views to something else because in this day and age it's not super easy but it's it's pretty easy to get a video that like goes viral and does a ton of views but like okay great a bunch of people saw your stuff is that going to allow you to build a deeper connection with your audience and is that ultimately going to lead you to maybe be able to monetize more instead of focusing on views i would urge you to switch how you measure success to something more quantifiable like comments, shares, who you're talking to in the DMs, like the messages that you're getting, like are you making an impact? And views are only just like one part of it and I just don't think they're as important. Like we've talked about this, like not all views are the same. Yeah, and I think with, especially with educational stuff, right? If I make something educational, I would wanna see comments, shares, and saves. That's what I wanna see. I don't really care about the likes and Like we said, views, man, views are skewed, especially because the apps right now, they want you to have views, dude. It's like candy to them. They want to keep us posting on the apps, dude. So Reels, hyperinflating these views, man. It's not like this forever. Whatever app is popping with views, it's going to, the pendulum will shift. And it won't be popping anymore. We've had this conversation so many different times and I'm probably going to have it again where we're like, dude, TikTok sucks. We hate TikTok right now. TikTok's not giving us any love on the stuff that used to do super well. Reels is like, hey, come over here, dude. Zuck's like, we want to hang out with you. Please, please come. And we'll just, we'll just give you guys views. We promise. Right. 
we want to build a deep connection with the people that are watching our stuff. And that happens though, via you responding to comments, via you listening to people in the DMs, not having a robot responding to people. It's yeah. us, dude. We're the ones talking to you in the DMs, man. And I love it. I love listening to you guys and hearing about the things that you've learned, the struggles that you're going through, things that have happened in your lives. It's super interesting. And I think as as this thing continues to grow and there's right now on Instagram, I believe we're at like 63,000. When we're at 100,000 people on there, it's going to be an insane community of rocks. Yeah. Right now, it's already awesome. You guys are amazing. I can only imagine what it's going to be like when we have when we have a, an arena. I'm calling it arena, dude. I'm calling it arena tour. Okay. <laughs> you got an arena, 20,000 rocks in the arena, dude. <laughs> Putting my chip on the table now. That's going to be a beautiful feeling to know that all these people are united by a common thing that we're all interested in. We totally. all are nerding out over cameras. And I think that in these in these next few years, dude, you you got to always prioritize the people that are supporting the things that you're doing, that are commenting on your stuff, that are sharing your stuff, that are saving your stuff. And you're only going to know that from being in tune with those people, from not just posting and saying, yeah, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see what's in those comments. I don't want to hear the love. I don't want to hear the hate, dude. If you're going to get the love, you got to have a little bit of the hate. We see it on YouTube, dude. Some of these guys just roast us. What did some, some dipshit the other day said? I don't understand the value prop of this yeah, channel. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you commented, my boy, thanks for the comment. <laughs> I will say though, going back to like Hermosi's point, he audits his content. Like he he goes through and and measures the success of each piece of content based off of some metric, but he's measuring it and he's auditing it and he's figuring out how he should measure success and then what content is doing well based off of those metrics and then doubling down on that. And I think that if you aren't looking at your content and auditing your own content and thinking about how you can improve, figuring out what is working, what's not working and leaning more into what is working, like you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, it's it's almost, it's taking a step back and removing yourself as an artist, I think, which is very hard to do. Yeah. Uh, and like if, like if you want to play the game yeah, and, and I think many of you might th see hear that and be like, oh, these this is uh, this is the taking the art out of it. But I, I, I think as a creative person, we want people to see our stuff and we totally. want to have an impact with the things that we make. And the way that you are going to be able to do that is by taking a step back, throwing on your business hat, throwing on your entrepreneur hat and saying, OK, I posted this video. I thought it was going to do super well. Why did it not do well? What's going on? What was the day of the week that I posted this on? What time did I post this at? Uh, was there a big event like maybe the Met Gala or maybe Tom Brady's Rose that was going on where people weren't maybe on their phones, right? And looking at that and trying to just get better. And I think if you take a growth mindset with it, you will get better. More people will see your stuff. You'll engage a better community and you'll continue to grow and you will get the things that you want to get done. Also, I think we're seeing the shift right now, man. We've talked about this. We talked about this the last few episodes, but long form is the king, man. Totally. The creator businesses that are being built in 2024 and beyond are going to be from a long form piece of content. And those are two options. That's a podcast. That's a YouTube video. Those are where the people are making things actually happen. And that's where I feel the deepest connection with the people that I watch. That's why if yeah. I buy a piece of clothing, a hoodie, a sweat, a physical item of sorts, whatever it's going to be, it's from a YouTube creator. It's from a podcaster. And I'm sure if you guys all think about it, if you take a step back and say, what have I ever bought from someone online? If you guys are someone who supports creators, you damn sure should. If you're here, man, we support your local creator here. You got it. You got to think about that. Where are they coming from? They're probably not from Instagram and definitely not from TikTok, I bet. Right. They're from the long form thing. And that's that's where you're able to not just get this little one minute snippet of someone in a long form piece. You get someone's true authentic self. It's really hard to act for like an hour. If they do that, man, kudos to them. I couldn't do it. You're getting me. You're getting the raw, real version of myself. And I think with short form, people are able to to be someone that they're not. You know, and, and I think I think with long form content, it's always going to be king. And if you aren't currently creating long form content, I would think about what you want to produce, whether it's a podcast and you're helping people with X, Y and Z, you're sharing your perspective, you're sharing something you've been through or you're making YouTube videos. Those are really your two options that I would be putting my time and attention into. And then from the long form pieces, you can chip off little short form pieces, whether it's shorts, reels, TikToks, and it can all come from this one 10 minute or to, to up to an hour or even more piece of content. I'm thinking about creators. Like I have bought, I want to say, I don't know if I've bought merch off of someone just off of Instagram. 
I think there is a way that you can build a business off of like short form content just on Without Instagram. Without a doubt, yeah. You can. Like, people, are, people have done it. You're not, you, you, we're but, not going to sit here and be like, you can't do, make any sales or anything. Do you think though that like, I'd argue though that yes, without a doubt you can make, you can sell something, whether it's like a keyboard, whatever we, yeah. we, we see a lot of gamers. I feel like with the short form content sure. doing super well in their respective fields. I don't think though that that's like, that's not the $10 million exit companies that no. we're, that we're seeing in the creator economy. Those are from the long form people. Like Logan Paul is not able to make prime. No. Just off of like TikTok. Absolutely videos. not. If we only posted clips on TikTok and Instagram reels and then try to sell merch, we wouldn't have sold nearly as much no. as we did. It's because we have the long form piece of content where you guys come every week we and, can, and and we kick it for, for 45 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half. And like you just build a deeper connection. It's the reason why like you know, people are saying what's up to us at a concert or, or a Lakers game or why they would like come out to a live event that we put on. Like you just, you build a deeper connection that, that goes farther than just a like or a comment or, or a, you know, a, a DM conversation. Like having long form content allows you to build a connection with your audience that you just can't through short form content. Yeah, and I even spoke to Samir about this from this week from Colin and Samir's show. Great podcast. You guys should go check it out. They do a ton of awesome stuff. I was asking Samir about our YouTube clips because we recently started doing that on our on our main channel. We're posting shorter three to ten minute clips. And our reasoning for doing that was saying, hey, if we post clips like this, our hope is that it hits the algorithm. Maybe one of these hits ten thousand, right? And we get a hundred new people that want to hang out with us on a weekly basis. But then Samir was explaining to me how some of these these clips we post, right, our average view duration for those clips, let's say it's a five minute clip and it gets a five minute average view. People watch the whole thing all the way through. YouTube is going to see that and say, you know what, this channel, we're going to show this channel to the people that like these five minute long videos. It's an algorithm, right? And so if we're posting let's say a month, we post four long pieces and then we post 20 of the short pieces. YouTube is going to say this channel is in the three to 10 minute range, right? And then it's going to show this content, all of our long stuff to those people that loved the three to 10 minute stuff. And those viewers are not the same. A long form viewer and a short form viewer are completely different people. And when you sit down for a YouTube video, if you're one of the people that watches this on YouTube, please subscribe, helps us a ton. Let's get to 7K. If you're one of those people that watch the longer form stuff, you want to sit down. You're maybe watching TV in the morning. Maybe you watch in the morning. Maybe you watch it before you go to bed. Maybe it's an hour long commute for your subway ride, right? That's when you're tuning in to watch whatever pod it is that you tune into or this one, whatever, right? So we're now separating those. And I think it's very interesting uh, when you're looking at just the content as a whole and how it plays into your strategy for the things that you're making, right? We're now keeping this channel solely dedicated to the long form pods. So it's easier also to navigate. If you pop on, we don't want you to be like, where are the episodes at? There's 20 other things muddying up this home screen. We just want to see the long form apps. And then we're going to have the shorts channel for its own short clips to continue to hopefully grow. And maybe we'll get a few listeners and stuff from there. But that's something that I would be thinking about if you are producing long form content on on YouTube. And we had been debating do we keep the short form clips on our main channel or do we make another channel? And we just like, didn't know what to do. No one text message, man. And and then we just talked to the goat Samir (laughs) and he, you know, solved all of our problems. But we are also thinking it's like viewers aren't stupid. Like if they come across a clips channel, they, you can see in the title, it says five five podcast clips, right? It's obviously from a fucking podcast. If they want to see the full episode, they'll find the other channel because we'll have it linked. But also like I'm thinking about the way that I like to consume a podcast and you're right. It's like either I'm listening to it, like on my way to the gym or on my drive or I'm cooking and I'm eating. And it's rare that I sit down to listen to a full episode. I I consume, I would say 90 to 95% of my podcasts, the way I consume them as clips on YouTube, as opposed to listening to like the full length ones. You're a half-assed fan. I guess, but like, (laughs) 
I, I don't know. It's it's just people consume stuff differently. Totally. So I think it's important that we have both. You hit different buckets of people that want to watch the stuff. You do. And, and you know, there's going to be some people that only watch the podcast through the TikTok and Instagram reels. There's going to be some people that really are dedicated and watch full length, full episodes. There's going to be some people who are just tuning into those five to 10 minute, you know, clips. So now I feel like we're hitting every bucket and it'll be really interesting to see how it does. But yeah, we were, we were debating, like, do we, do we keep everything on one channel or do we make another one? We've also like, now we're gonna have to like build up a second channel in this subscribers. Is a fun game. Yeah, we're in it for the long haul. Baby. Yeah, we're, we're, this is a fun game. Last point that we're going to leave you with is Hormozzi said to assume nothing and explain everything. And he gave different examples of the thumbnails that he was using. And so he had this one that was like, Alex Hormozzi, what I eat in a day. And he's like, because he assumes that people when they see that, they're like, oh, I know Alex Hormozzi. People don't know who Alex Hormozzi is, right? And he's like, I want any person that comes across this video on their YouTube recommended to say, that, that could be me. Alex had these two examples of these different thumbnails, right? And one, he was on a private jet and it's like Alex Ramosi day in the life. And he's assuming that people know who Alex Ramosi is. People don't know who Alex Ramosi is that are getting served this on YouTube. They're just seeing that and they're like, I don't really care about Alex Ramosi. I don't know who this guy is, right? So he said if he would change it, it would change it to day in the life of a $200 million CEO. People that are interested in business are going to say, okay, He's not just a guy who made a million, he's made 200 million. This is someone who I might wanna to listen to. Let me click on this video, let me see what this guy is about. Just by changing the little words on the description, on the title of your YouTube, you get a totally different person who might now actually click and say, I'm gonna hang out with you, I'm gonna learn something from you. And maybe they'll convert into a fan, maybe they'll convert into a customer of yours, and maybe that person will hang out and maybe watch another video. It's interesting though, and we were talking about this, how I see his point. Yeah. I, I, I like the point of, of assume nobody likes you. Um, <laughs> no way. Did you get it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like his point of assume nothing, but to a certain extent, I, I think it's, it's healthy and an ego check to assume that nobody fucking knows you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm showing up to these concerts being like, yo, what's up, baby? Like, y'all watch the pod? Crickets. <laughs> Um, but I think there's something to be said about building that rapport and like not having to introduce yourself in, in every video. Um, we talked about having like some sort of elevator pitch. I, I really like those the educational type of content where it's like, today I'm going to teach you like why you should be using a credit card instead of a debit card. I specialize in making financial content. Like you have your little elevator pitch, whatever, like you have your hook and the elevator pitch and then you get into like the actual content. I think that it'd be weird if every time we started the show, it was like, hi, my name is Braden Figueroa. Yes. I went to the University of Oregon. I work for the Ducks. I work for the Lakers. And now I'm here and I do this podcast with you guys. That'd be weird. But it would be, it'd be like an awkward thing. But, but something we changed was Tom, like, for the first, I don't even know, what, 50, 60 episodes, yeah. like we didn't have a trailer and we just started like, hey, so-and-so, hey, Jack Cook, like do the one-handed crack. And you have people clicking the, the, the video because they saw the title and thumbnail and it's something that's like interesting to them. You have to confirm the click like Hayden was talking about. And in that first minute, like the first minute is so important. If, if you don't get some sort of information um, and some sort of value or like understand what is going to be talked about later on in the video and you just go into like, you know, doing a one in, one handed crack that nobody knows about or like they don't know anything about this person. So like we now have structured the podcast to where the first minute, minute and a half is snippets, like, you know, some of the best snippets that we feel like describe and encapsulate the whole podcast episode. Okay, we have that. Then we have our little trailer, which shows like stuff that we've filmed B-roll. You kind of get a little bit of- So you might be like, hey, these guys are kind of kind of decent at making videos. Oh, they, they shoot LeBron? Okay. They shoot cool stuff. Then we go into introducing the podcast guest because it's like, more times than not, it's not some fucking A-list celebrity. Like we're hoping yet. that you, yet. <laughs> we're hoping you guys like, you know, are familiar with with the guests, but like, if you're not, let us tell you a little bit about who this person is and what we talked about on the podcast so we can confirm the click more. We weren't doing that. And I think that like, it's elevated our show a lot since we have started doing that. I think there's some contrast here with what he's saying because he's like, oh, I, I assume no one no one knows you and whatnot, but I, I think a reason why I personally love our show is because I feel a super deep connection with you guys. And it's funny because let's say someone finds us today. Let's say you just hopped on. You're now a rock, okay? 
You don't know what a rock is. I'm not going to explain it to you. You're going to have to go back, go back through the catalog. You're going to figure it out. And someone texted me the other day and they were at episode 11 and they're like, what is a rock, dude? And I'm like, you're going to get there. I promise you'll get there. <laughs> like you're a part of it, dude. You're, yeah. you're a part of it. We're all rocks. Like everyone's a rock. I think though, to his point, he is doubling down on only educational content. Mm. So I think like if you are making educational content, yeah, you should like introduce yourself or like, you know, have that elevator pitch to, you know, to have that or build that credibility with a new viewer and assume that nobody knows you. But if you're making the entertainment content, like, like daily vlogging, like you look at Casey Neistat, Casey Neistat in every video wasn't, Hey, I'm Casey Neistat. And I made the show on the HBO called the Neistat brothers. And weird. I'm a filmmaker. Like, it's weird. Like you just get right into it and you're like, assume like you're talking to a best friend and it's like, okay, this is what we're doing today. And then you're at episode 50 of yeah. your or episode like 300 of his thing. And you're like, Oh, I want to go back and look at the catalog and then you learn more as you go and you almost get into like for example he'd be like oh marlon what's up marlon's here and you're like who the heck is marlon yeah and he comes in with all these packages and you're like huh okay and then you go back to one of the earlier episodes he goes this is marlon he's my delivery man and i love this guy and you're like oh okay marlon has this deep history and then you see that they did this charity for i don't remember what it was for but they did like a charity together it was like his sister his sister yeah and and, and casey it was and his fans were able to raise all of this money for the family and it and then you you have such a deeper connection because you've been through all these things with a character as yeah or with this person as they're developing over like a year or two years and i feel like it's the same thing with this show you guys have seen and we'll continue to see so many interesting life events that are going to happen in the next year and the next few years that you're going to be like, oh, and you're here with us through all of it. And we're going to share it all with you. And even if you go back to episode one, when we didn't even all have the same microphone, <laughs> right? And we, we, we had like half a light yeah. and now we have like wood panels. This is great. We have wood panels. One of these days, I promise you guys, we're going to get that neon sign. It's sitting right over there. We just got to get a task rabbit. Well, we got to do, we got to finish off the wall because yeah. we got to kill two birds with one stone, man. Yeah. We can't just be hiring people to come over and hang out. But you guys are here with us is the moral of this story. <laughs> so something we did in this podcast when we first started was we explained the one-handed crack. We never explained the one-handed <laughs> crack because we just assumed that everybody knows what the fuck it is. So that is one way that we, I think going forward, probably to start the episodes, we're going to be like, okay, this is the one-handed crack. If you know, you know, but like, these are the rules because again, yeah, taking his advice, like assume that nobody knows you. Like you can't assume that everybody knows what the fucking one-handed crack is. I feel like everyone does at this point know what that, that is a global <laughs> phenomenon. You're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. I, I'm going to make a drink one day and I'm going to have something to do where there's going to be a challenge and every month someone's going to get like $10,000 for the best crack. What, um, what kind of drink would you make? Are you going energy drink? I, Are you going water, I, coffee, I got to go caffeine okay. because it just starts my day correctly. Yeah. And 98% of the caffeine brands are just awful for you and taste like shit. So I think I could do some damage in the caffeinated market. One day it'll be a yeah. thing. Dude, ladies and gentlemen, that's episode 108, dude. Crazy. One of these days we're going to get to quadruple figures. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the 505 Podcast. If you're still here, please hit the subscribe button, leave a comment down below, and we'll see you all next week. Peace. Peace.